message this morning, since it is now December and we're headed towards the Christmas season. What I would like to do for the next several weeks is slow it down a little bit and talk about Christmas steps. Now, you might have noticed from the picture, when I talk about steps, I'm talking about a very particular kind of steps, okay? How many of you guys remember learning how to walk? Weird, right? We all had to do it, and yet no one really remembers this process, and yet it's a crucial part of life, right, to learn how to walk. And now when we walk around as adults, it's a pretty unimpressive thing, right? You walk around, you put one foot in front of the other, the arms kind of stay down, and it's just whatever. Congratulations, you can walk. But when we watch a baby do it, right, and we see those little chubby legs, they don't just put just one foot in front of the other. Their legs are like out here, and the arms are like here, right? And you see their faces, there's this focus on their face or like this big gleeful smile as they take one step in front of the other. You're like, that's amazing. You're learning how to walk. And we see the joy in it and the wonder in it. And as I've been watching my son who's going through this now, he's taking more and more steps. I thought one day, I said, Jesus had to learn how to do this. The baby Jesus had to learn how to walk. Now, he's Jesus. So I don't know whether it took two steps, two minutes, two hours, two weeks, right? But at some point, he who became fully human had to learn how to take steps. And so that's what I'm going to do for the next four weeks is I want us to slow it down and focus on one step at a time. We're going to focus on one verse at a time. And we're going to spend the next four weeks in two chapters of the Bible. And we're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to look at the prophecy relating to the coming of John, the prophecy of Jesus, and then the birth of John and the birth of Jesus. And I'm also doing this because I don't know about you guys, but the world is encouraging me to run, not walk. And so what I want to do is give all of us an opportunity on Sunday morning just to step, just to walk, just to sit, and just relax. Because when I think about what Christmas is, it's about that. It's about slowing things down and appreciating what we have and appreciating those around us. So I want to encourage us as we go through this series to do that in your life. Spend time on that one person at a time, one gift at a time, one event at a time. And let's just step. Let's just walk into the coming of Jesus in the form of a baby who learned how to walk. So we're going to start today with the prophecy of John. And we're going to be looking at Luke 1, 5 through 25. So if you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, I will read through it to you. We'll take it in pieces, starting with Luke 1, verses 5 through 7. And I want you to do this one more thing before I read this. Pretend, I know it's hard, pretend you've never heard or read this before. Okay, I know it's hard because many of us have heard this, but pretend you're reading this and hearing this for the very first time. Here we go, verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. That's a nice way to say getting old. Right? Like getting on in years. Okay, first thing I want you to notice, if you had read this or heard this for the very first time, who is this about? Think about it. The whole focus, right? They don't mention Jesus. They don't mention John. All they mention are these two parents. And the parents are descendants of the priestly line, and they're righteous, which is a big thing, right? They're not just priests. They're acting like it, right? They're not just from a priestly lineage. They're actually acting like it. They actually are righteous, and they got no kids, and it's unlikely they're going to have kids. So it's going to take a miracle to give them a child. Isn't this where you would send Jesus, right, to these type of parents? I think this is written this way intentionally to build suspense, to really be like, oh, wow, look at these two remarkable people. And it would take a miracle to give them a kid. So maybe this is where Jesus is going to come. Then we keep reading, right? But the other thing before we go on to the next section is I want to encourage all of you guys this morning. Don't give up. Try to put yourself in the shoes of these two people who had been waiting and waiting and waiting. And they weren't able to have a child. And yet all of a sudden, God shows up and performs a miracle in their lives. 
This is a great reminder of how God sometimes works. God's late, maybe right on time. What we consider to be late might be right on time. Well, think about it this way. Our infertility may be God's fertility. Our inability might be God's ability. Our powerlessness is exactly where we get to see God's hand and God's power. And so I don't know where this hits you guys. Uh, I know several couples who are in the shoes of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they just, they want to have a child so bad, but they haven't been able to do that. And so if it's that's you, don't give up. Don't give up, or maybe that's not you, but there's something else. There's something else you've been waiting a long time for. That's a broken relationship. It's a situation. It's this thing you've been wanting and hoping for, and you just, God, I want it now. Just don't give up. Don't give up, because God might be doing something. It might not be right for our time, but it's perfect for his time. So just don't give up. Let's keep reading verses 8 through 17. Once when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you'll name him John. You'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. He'll turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. First thing I want you to notice is this, is how Zechariah was even chosen to be in this place at this time. It says he was chosen by lot, which choosing by lot, right, is just a seemingly random process where someone draws something and that puts them in that place and at that time. The other thing you got to know is this, is the priests weren't there every single day. They were actually on rotation and the priests would only be there one week, twice a year. So really, we're talking about two weeks. Out of 52 weeks, it would even be possible that he's here right now. And he's chosen by lot, seemingly randomly, to have this thing happen. What are the chances, right? They're not good at all. Not good at all. And yet God perfectly works his will and his plan through this seemingly random situation. I bring this up for this reason for you guys. Sometimes, in the middle of our ordinary day, when things seem to just be random... It's really God working his perfect timing and his perfect will and his perfect plan. And that's what he does here. It's, of course, completely ordained that he was chosen by Lot to be there at that time for this encounter with that particular angel. But the other thing Zechariah teaches is this. If you want to hear from God, go to the altar. Notice where he was, right? This happened in part because he's there serving God. He's at the altar of God. He's offering an incense from God. And so I recognize that me here preaching this to you guys, I am preaching to the choir, right? You're here, and I'm grateful that you are here. But this doesn't just apply to Sunday morning, right? You want to hear from God even during the week? Go to God. Go to the altar. Go to his book. Go to him in prayer. Go to him in worship, singing, playing an instrument, all the different forms that that looks like. If you want to hear from him, go to him. That's when God gets the best opportunity to speak to us is when we just go to him and we say, I want your attention. And the angel shows up, and you all know what happens, right, when angels show up. People freak out, and so the angels always say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And the message here, he actually doesn't use the word fear. Usually they would use the word fear. The word here is a little bit different. The word is terrasso. And terrasso can tra- be translated shaken, stirred up, troubled, or agitated. The angel is saying to him, look, don't be stirred up or agitated or upset that I'm here. I get it's surprising. 
I know it's unusual, but don't be troubled by the fact that I'm here. I'm actually coming with really, really good news. But when I think about this idea of stirring up, I think about what I did right before Thanksgiving. And I know a lot of you guys have done a lot of baking and cooking. And one of the things that you've got to do when you cook well with most things is stir, right? Lots of stirring. Keep it moving. Keep it from burning. Make sure everything mixes together right. Sometimes God stirring things up can be a really good thing. Shakes up the routine, right? Changes things a little bit to get our attention. So don't be freaked out when God does that. It could be because he wants to get your attention. He wants to tell you a really good thing for you, to give you a really powerful message like what happened here with Zechariah. And I love what the angel says. It says, your prayer has been heard. But if you notice from what we read, there's no prayer that's stated in here. And I love this. It's assumed appropriately that these two have been praying for a child. Right? But the reality is you've got to talk to God for him to hear you. You can't just say, oh, this is something that keeps me up at night, so God's going to answer. What if you go to him and ask him for that thing? That's what he wants you to do. He wants to talk to you very specifically. I'm amazed how many people will come to me and say, hey, so I really want to hear from God on this, but he's just been really quiet. I haven't, I haven't heard it. What's that all about? And sometimes God does that, right? But then I'll say, okay, so what is it that you want? What is it you've been talking to him about? And they'll tell me, and I'll ask them some questions, and they get real specific. I'm like, okay, that specific thing, have you asked God for that? Well, no. Okay, look, we can get specific with him. Does that mean he's going to answer it that night? No, not necessarily. But he wants us to go to him with very specific things, even if it's something over and over and over again, which is, I'm sure, what happened here. With Zechariah and Elizabeth saying over and over and over again, God, we want a child. And this angel comes and says, guess what? God's heard you. He's heard your prayer. But we have to talk with him if we want him to hear us. Then the angel says, you're going to have a child, an incredible blessed child, and I want you to name him John. Now, do we have any Johns here in the church right now? Any Johns? One? Any more than one? Okay. Okay. John is an awesome name. It's a very common name. And I want you to know, young man, that you have a very, very special name. And I bring this up because I think we hear that word John, like, oh, yeah, another John. It's one of the most popular names of all time, right? There's a reason for it. Check out what it means. The word is he wanted. He wanted. It means Yahweh has been gracious or shown favor. This is a powerful name. It means that John, this baby, is the living illustration of the favor and grace of God. Not bad, right? A literal living blessing from God. That's how incredible that name really is. And this John, he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. Notice it doesn't just say he's great or that he's going to be great. He says he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. It's a great reminder for all of us, right? We're not so great when we're out of sight. When we're out of God's sight, we're out of his will, out of his way, out of his word, not so great. This John's going to be great. He's going to be in the Lord's sight. The Holy Spirit we're going to get into is involved even with his birth, and he's going to stay there. And because he's going to stay there on that path, on that way, he's going to do great things for God. And if we want to do that, we've got to do the same thing. But we have to remain in the sight of the Lord. And then this part about the Holy Spirit, right? The angel says the Holy Spirit is going to be involved even before he's born. This is an incredible picture. That means in the womb of Elizabeth, you have a baby and the Spirit. It's as if John came out with the Spirit. And you've got to remember, for these people, right, hearing this and reading this, the Holy Spirit wasn't discussed nearly as much as I think the Spirit is even discussed today. The Spirit has been involved, no doubt, but they didn't really have this discussion and this idea that the Spirit was as involved in their personal lives. And the angel says the Spirit is going to be so involved, he's actually going to be inside of your wife helping to create this baby. It's a beautiful picture of the intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And it's a good thing, because John's got a tough assignment, right? It's actually laid out here for Zechariah. He says John's going to do three things, and these are three really big things. First thing, you've got to turn the hearts of the parents toward the children. 
Second thing, you've got to turn the disobedient toward wisdom. And the third thing is you've got to prepare the way of the Lord. I mean, just look at the first thing. Turning the hearts of the parents towards the children. You guys think this would be something good that happened today? Yeah, absolutely. We got way too many irresponsible dads, moms, running around, not taking care of their children. Some of you might even say, how about turning the hearts of the kids towards the parents? Right? And that's legit too. That absolutely is. But here the assignment is they're going to turn the hearts. John is going to help turn the hearts of the parents toward their children to take care of them, to love them, to instruct them. And then the second assignment is a little broader. It's not just the families. John is going to help turn the disobedient toward wisdom. John's here to remind the world that there's a way to live, and you better get to it. And that's the wisdom literature, and it's the things that John is going to share when he teaches, of course. And he's doing both of those things because his general assignment is to prepare the way of the Lord. No pressure. Right? This son is going to be sent to essentially pave the way, to pave the path for the coming of Jesus Christ and all he's going to share and all he is going to do. That's John's assignment. So I would hope, right, that the Holy Spirit would be involved with that type of an assignment. Let's look at uh, verses 18 through 20. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I'm an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. First thing I noticed was this, Zechariah's question. This is a powerful, dangerous question. He says, how will I know? And the angel's response, in other words, is, maybe you won't. It's not about you knowing. It's about you trusting. It's about you obeying. Here's the thing. Trust does not imply full understanding. We can trust things without fully understanding them. Now, if that seems ignorant to you, I got a question. How many of you have a phone? A phone in any capacity, in your home, right, in your pocket. How many of you know fully how that thing works? But we use it. We generally trust it. I know it makes mistakes. Mine does too. But I generally trust it. I presume it's going to work. I don't understand that thing fully. I could say the same thing for my car. I don't understand completely how that sucker works. I just trust it's going to get me there. Right? Computers, all these things that we trust day in and day out, but I don't fully understand it. We can do that with our phones. Can't we do that with God? Say, look, I get that I don't understand you completely, God. I'm trying, right? I'm reading this book, but I trust you. That's what God and the angel want out of Zechariah. Just trust him, even though you don't know, even though you don't fully understand. Because the reality is that God shines when we can't. When we can't do, God does. And he is obviously and easily glorified in those types of situations. Jesus said it perfectly later on in Luke. Luke 18, 27, what is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Those very moments, those very things that you and I can't do are the very things that we need to hand over to God and say, all right, you do it. And I trust that you can do it. And it's in those moments that he is glorified. He shines. But when you doubt God, you doubt God at your own risk. You doubt God at your own risk. There is a risk when we say, God, you're not capable of doing this, and I just don't know how this is going to get done. There is a risk that happens when we do that. Now, this risk is pretty familiar to you guys, and it should be familiar to the people who heard this. Remember we read last week, we talked about vision, and we read through Genesis 15. There was another challenging question that happened there. Right after the promise is made to Abram, Abram said, Oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And God said to him, Bring me a sacrifice. Great answer to the question, right? You're not going to know. You're not going to know. It's not about you knowing. It's about you trusting. 
This is something that's happened to God before, and so we need to read it and understand. But then when we get those moments and God says, I'm going to do something through you, and you're like, I don't see how you're going to do it. That's the very moment we need to trust that God is actually going to do it. But notice what happened to Zechariah here. Notice the grace of God here. What happened to Zechariah is that his voice of doubt was muted. Zechariah didn't lose the blessing, folks. Imagine what would have happened, right? If this whole interaction goes down and the angel says, I'm going to do this for you. And Zechariah says, how will I know? And the angel's like, whew, did God pick the wrong guy? I'm just kidding. You know what? You're right. You're not going to have a kid. Right? But it doesn't happen that way. That's God's grace. It's God's mercy. He says, you're going to get the blessing. I'm going to give you guys this child. I'm going to work my way in the world through you guys. But I'm just not going to let you talk about it. Because you're doubting me. God doesn't need a bunch of doubters. Right? Zechariah lost his ability to communicate doubt in the blessing. He didn't lose the blessing. Same thing happens today. God doesn't need a bunch of doubters running around. He needs a bunch of trusters running around. They still got the incredible blessing that is, that was John. Let's see what happens next with verses 21 through 23. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I just, I want to see it. Like, I really wish I would have been able to see this. So you guys know I love Google Images. So I Googled this sucker, and this is my favorite. This is my favorite rendering of what this might have looked like. I love Zechariah's huge, open eyes, right, trying to communicate to them that he can't speak, and they're all trying to figure out what happened, what's taken so long. It would be as if I came up here to do a sermon and then just did this. And you would leave within like a couple of minutes, right? But notice what happened when he did this. They said, oh, he must have had a vision from God. Not because Zechariah told him, but because God left him speechless. Like, oh, Zechariah is being crazy. That must be God, right? That must be the power of God. God can do that. He can leave us totally speechless, unable to describe what he's done for us what he's going to do for us, the feeling that you had, it's what God can do, and he left him speechless. And yet Zechariah sends a beautiful message in his motioning and his expression, and then what he did next. Notice it said that Zechariah finished his service. Now, if I were in Zechariah's shoes, I probably would have thrown a pity party and gone home. If I had lost my voice, fine, God, I just came here to serve you, and now I can't talk, I'm going home, I'm done. But he didn't do that. He stayed, and he finished his service even though he couldn't use his voice at all. There's a powerful witness there for us. Even when things don't go our way, that doesn't mean we stop serving him, and we stop heading towards that thing that he's called us to go towards, that call he has on your life, that mission he has for you, just because things aren't going great, or something unexpected happens doesn't mean you should stop, pack up your stuff, and go home. Let's look at the next couple of verses and wrap up this passage for today. After those days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. So now we get a glimpse here of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth conceived. This word conceived, it's a very powerful word. I think today it's even become a somewhat controversial word. What is conception? When exactly does it start? And the word in Greek is sulambano. And sulambano means to conceive or to catch. It's actually the exact same word that was used when they caught fish in Luke 5, 9. Am I saying the baby's a fish? No. What I'm saying is the same type of activity it's a catching of something or someone from somewhere else. Something outside of us, like catching a fish. This is the moment that Elizabeth caught, conceived, and received this baby from God. It wasn't created just by her and her husband. It's something that God was intimately involved in the creation of. That's the moment of conception. And then we know the Holy Spirit is involved 
inside the womb, the forming of the baby. And then, of course, coming later is that birth. Now, I've been through this process just watching, right, to be clear. <laughs> and I watched it, and I remember that moment of birth, and the way it felt to me was the official handoff from God. God's like, I've been working on this little one for months, and so has your wife, of course. But now it's yours. And it's exhilarating and terrifying, right, all at the same moment. That handoff from God. And that's what this is. God is literally handing this off to Elizabeth. She's receiving it. She's conceiving it. And of course, she's going to talk about it. Now, I love in here that she remains in seclusion for several months, right? All the introverts are like, amen. But she doesn't stay there. After that, she testifies to what God has done for her. And she says two things. God looked upon her. God saw me, in other words. Which I think really is what all of us want. God sees you. He looks upon you. And then he did something about it. He took away her shame. Doesn't that sound just like God? Just like Jesus, right? To take away her shame. And so she testifies about this, even before John shows up. God, we thank you for coming our direction. You came to us and you did it through a child, a baby, who had to learn how to walk. And he had to learn how to walk so he could stand up, carry a cross, and go to a hill so that we never have to. And we cannot thank you enough, and yet you call us when we gather together to do this in remembrance of what you've done, Jesus, and we do that now. So as we prepare our hearts for that, as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, I pray that we'll remember, Jesus, what you did for us. As we take the bread, we remember your body broken for us. As we take the cup of juice, Jesus, we remember your blood poured out for us. We thank you so much for your love and for your sacrifice. And Jesus, it is in your name we do this and pray. Amen.